letter of John. You may notice in the bulletin, the Bible study is co-workers with God. Uh, we're actually looking at verses 3 through 8, but I think I'll just read the first two also to get the, the whole background. But this is some fascinating material. Your line is, we'll be the judge of that. But I think it's really, really kind of, you know, current. Um, we try to be really practical on Wednesday nights, the gospel, you know, in shoe leather. But here we are. Third letter of John, written probably just before the end of the first century. He was the longest lived apostle, as far as we know, died a natural death. There are some uh, myths, legends, and other things that he was, uh, they attempted to martyr him and nothing worked. But in any case, from all we can tell, he, he passed away uh, from natural causes in his 90s. First John, I'm sorry, third John, beginning with verse 1, our text kind of 3 through 8. The elder, this is again, yeah, you know what I'll do? I'll just, I'll hold it. Yeah, I'll hold it. That way I won't have to worry about staying in front. Thanks for that, mate. Um, we've mentioned the word elder here. Uh, we get the word Presbyterian from that, presbyteros, which means either old in age or mature in the faith. And for John, at this point, it would be both. This is one of three words used of the pastoral office, pastor being the second and then bishop the third. Three different words for the same person or office. The elder unto the well-beloved Yeus, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, that's singular, we'll and make a note on that in just a minute. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. Even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And then here's our teaching point, verses 5 through 8 in particular. Again, beloved, singular, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers which have borne witness of thy love before the church, whom, if you bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, you shall do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We, therefore, ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I remember many years ago reading a really, I thought, interesting and kind of comical testimony of a world-class evangelist and he was looking back on his life um, at this point you know he had been he had held the largest um, mass crusade in the in the history of the nation of India India but this was when he was looking back when he started out on the evangelistic trail and he said he was in a meeting with his wife at somebody else's meeting they were just attending he was a young preacher and they for some reason weren't sitting in the same pew they were separated you know and uh, they gave the appeal for a missionary outreach and uh, they were like most evangelists between the rock and the hard place financially. And yet he felt the spirit of God say, give everything you have. And he tested it. It came back three times. You know, so he just threw caution to the wind, said, I'm going to partner with this new missionary outreach. And he dumped it in. Well, he didn't realize his wife had gotten the same message at the other side of the auditorium. <laughs> and after the meeting was over, when they came together, they were both red-faced because they were both afraid of telling the other what God had told them to do. And it was a double whammy when they found out the Lord had told both of them to do the same thing. They didn't even have money for gasoline to get to the next meeting. But they trusted the Lord and they just believed that they'd heard from God. And because they had put God's work first and chosen to partner with this new missionary outreach, that God was going to take care of them. And sure enough, I think it was a total stranger at that meeting on the way out as everybody was leaving came over and put money in their hands that was more than enough to fill their gas tank and get them to the next place. For a few seconds they had giver's remorse but they stayed in faith and God blessed it. That's a, that's a spiritual principle, being co-workers together with God. And that's what we want to look at tonight. A very practical part of our Christian living. I didn't plan it this way, but it's, it's almost like the dessert after the 12-week series we did on miracle money and all the things related to finance and the kingdom of God. Most of you know if you've been here a while. Very seldom preach on that subject. The Lord just doesn't lead that way. But I think he felt it was time, and I want to get that new book together. In any case, this is kind of the, the dessert. So we want to look at this in two ways tonight. First of all, the concept of doing the right thing. In this case tonight, partnering with the Holy Spirit and getting the gospel to people who need it. 
and then how you and I can be co-workers with God. I want to notice, first of all, that John is not talking to a particular church necessarily, but he's writing to a person. I'm mentioning that because that one line that I read to you, beloved, verse 2, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. How many have heard that preach a time or two or 10,000? Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, one of the key scriptures for Dr. Cho's ministry in Seoul. Did you know that? He's actually got it, from what I understand, engraved on one of the walls. Uh, you know, that there's a threefold blessing, you know, spirit, soul, and body. And there is. The only problem is this is not written to Christians in general. This is written to one man. Beloved is singular, yeos. And John's not preaching doctrine here. Of course God wants us to be saved. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to be well taken care of, of course. But that wasn't what he was saying. It was just a greeting. Hey, hope you're well, you know, like you and I would say. Hey, how, how you going? You know, just kind of wishing you the best. And just kind of throwing that in free of charge. Uh, sometimes you can really get a hobby horse going on a scripture that's really not what you, you think it is or you say that it is, you know. So this is just a greeting. And uh, probably this was meant to go not just to Yeos and his little fellowship, but probably around uh, to the other churches, kind of like Paul's letter to Ephesus, and he mentions the letter he wrote to the Laodiceans. And uh, from what we can tell, that epistle was not um, kept for the church from the, by the Holy Spirit. For some reason, the body of Christ maybe didn't need that. But the truth here applies to every fellowship. So here we are. Beloved one. Everybody say beloved one. Yeah, he's talking to one man, Yeos. You are doing faithfully, which is uh, verse 5. You are doing faithfully whatever you may have worked out toward the brothers and toward the strangers. This is a beautiful picture. This is a picture of a pastor and people working together who apparently were in the habit of a good work. And the good work was having a ripple effect. So people knew that this pastor, this church, were the real deal. Because of what was happening as a result of their ministry, anybody, sinner or saint, could tell they were walking, they're talking. Their faith worked. Isn't that, an, isn't that important? He comments on their generosity to Adelphus, brothers, right? And Xenos, which means strangers. And this is an interesting word. It does not necessarily mean non-Jewish people. There's another word for that, as we're going to see, and John actually uses that. But this word means a stranger, somebody outside of a certain people group. So here we're not talking about Jewish people or Gentiles. We're talking about what group of people? The church. And these outsiders that were being blessed were people who hadn't yet come into covenant with the Lord, who hadn't yet received the fruit of the gospel, but they needed it. And this pastor and this people of God were blessing both believers and unbelievers, those outside. So this is kind of important. So the love that they were expressing in good works was not toward Jewish believers and Gentile believers, but toward believers, period, versus non-believers. How many are tracking with me? I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of talk today and teaching and preaching that almost emphasizes now we've got one body of Christ, you know, one church, but let's remember we've got Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers. And, you know, there's kind of a little bit of a difference, and it's almost like if you're a Jewish believer, you should be expected to not only believe in the Messiah, but also follow the various, you know, customs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, not necessarily true. We find in the early church, Peter didn't do that. Paul brought him up short, actually, about that. Said, hey, you know what? You were eating with the Gentiles. You weren't eating kosher. You were spending time with non-Jewish people until those people from Jerusalem came. Then you separated yourself. He said, you weren't, you're, not, you're not walking your talk there. So this is not talking about two different kinds of believers. It's talking about Christians versus non-Christians. And uh, the normal word for, for Gentiles is ethnos, 
But that, this is not that. This is xenos, which just means, again, somebody outside. Um, you know, you'd almost think about one of these uh, societies that people have, you know, the whatever, the Shriners or Masons or whatever, and they got secret handshakes and code words and all that. If you're not a member, you can't go to the meeting. You're an outsider. And, and that's kind of what this word means. So, again, it's important today when some are stressing differences between two kinds of believers, Jewish believers and Gentile believers, when there really isn't any, according to Paul, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, right? Male, female, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, cultured, uncultured, but Christ is all and in all. Amen? How many are glad about that? Yeah. All those distinctions disappear. Some of us in the body of Christ are trying, trying to resurrect them, you know? And uh, what God has set aside, we should leave alone. Amen? So again, the difference here is between saved and lost, not Jewish believer and Gentile believer. Now let's move along. Who testified of your love before the assembly? Everybody say who. You're all owls tonight. Who. Yeah. The word who grammatically refers to the brothers, the Christians, not the people outside. Who, the brothers, testified of your love before the church, before the assembly. So that's kind of interesting. The picture is... These missionaries or apostles were publicly testifying. Hey, you know that church that uh, Yeos is overseeing? They're the real deal. They are, they're the real deal. They not, only, they not only come together to pray, to praise, to worship, to minister in the gifts of the Spirit, to pray for the sick, to hear the Word, to celebrate the supper, uh, but they're interested in reaching out beyond their four walls to people who are still xenos, outside, and who need to be brought in. And, and this, apparently this testimony was really going far. Um, what were they doing, basically, that they got this kind of rep, that they got this kind of write-up, if you will, from men of God? They were partnering in a natural, material, financial, physical way with the gospel workers so that they were meeting their physical needs so that the gospel workers could meet the spiritual needs of people that hadn't yet come into the church, that hadn't accepted the faith. And some of these folks were, no doubt, uh, giving sacrificially, just like the evangelist and his wife that I just mentioned. Um, if you weren't here, I, I mentioned from our own ministry when I was evangelizing, um, we were on the radio, and, and, and we, this was back in the days of cassettes. Anybody remember those? And um, that's the redheaded stepchild of eight tracks. But uh, we were wanting to duplicate messages that I was preaching around the tri-state. Long story short, the church we attended had a radio rally for us, I mentioned. And there were probably 80, 90 people. Just, it was kind of, at, just kind of an average church. And they raised like $900, which was enough for the duplicator. Now, here's the cool thing, talking about that ripple effect. 25 years later, I will still get phone calls from people that tell me they're still listening to some of those cassettes. We, we did a ministry course that was captured on cassette tape. People are still playing those, those cassette tapes. That's, it's kind of crazy. That's like the gift that keeps on giving, and you, you just can't stop it, you know? Like Paul uh, writes to the Thessalonians, the Word of God is not bound you can't hold it back. Kind of exciting. How'd that happen? Uh, you know, because some, some Christians got involved. So this to me is very interesting. They're doing the right thing. They're walking. They're talking. Their testimony is being confirmed by the ministry leadership. And their, their love was concrete, demonstrative. It was concrete. It had, it had feet. It was doing something. They weren't just saying they believed and saying they cared about those outside. They were doing something about it. And that kind of reminds us of something that Paul wrote in Galatians 5 or 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision, being Jewish, nor uncircumcision, being Gentile, is a force, but rather faith working through love. Have you figured out yet that Paul was in the same denomination as James Paul basically said a real faith will work. It will do something. It will be motivated by love, and that will result in some kind of outward demonstration. 
James said it like this, faith apart from those corresponding actions is what? Dead. He doesn't say it's real faith, you're just not using it. He said it's dead. And the woods are full of believers, air quotes, believers that aren't really believers. How do we know that? By their lifestyle. They don't do what believers should do. They don't walk their talk. They don't demonstrate their faith through works of love. Amen? Uh, again, forgive the personal reference, but my first mission trip to England, uh, I think by all accounts, millionaire, uh, told us, you know what? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. We told him what kind of airfare we needed. You know what? And I thought to myself, he will, but not through you, brother. I forget where all the money came from, but you know, I think he, he gave us like 50 bucks. I thought, that's just beautiful, just perfect, you know. He could have funded everything. It wouldn't have even missed it. Bless his heart. Uh, and then you contrast him with a single mom who gave $2,700 to help with the rest of our airfare when our whole family went to Australia. You know, there's an, a, a millionaire that cuts a check for 50 bucks to send us to England. And there's a single mom who really needed that money. She sold some furniture. She really needed that money for her son, et cetera, et cetera. She felt like God told her to put towards our airfare. And uh, what a difference, you know, uh, what a difference. She was a blessing. Uh, she went to heaven in her early 40s had a, through an accident. But guess what? Her works are recorded and she's still reaping. Just imagine when the Lord returns and she stands before the judgment seat of Christ and it's payday. What a surprise. Daddy, big bucks. Maybe not so much, but she'll have a, she'll have a crown that you know be too big for her head probably. I love this stuff because this is something you and I have a say in. We can decide whether we want to do this or not. You know, We can be co-workers with God or not. I'll get to that in just a tick. So they're doing the right thing, walking, they're talking. Their testimony is confirmed by believers, uh, apostles in particular, uh, because of what they're doing, what they're making possible. So here it is. Let's look at this a little closer now. Being co-workers with God. How we can do it and why we do it. So John is continuing his advice to this, we assume, uh, house pastor, Yeos, whom you will do well having set forward worthily of God. This uh, set forward uh, propempsus is, is a combination of pro towards and uh, pempsus, you know, to send, I send forth. So the picture is this pastor and this local congregation had elected to launch a spiritual boomerang. How cool is that? We will get together and we'll get money together, we'll get funds together for the, you know, the, the boat ride, the food, whatever else they need to, to launch these missionaries, whoever they were and however many there were, into the field. And then after they do their work, they will come back, like we read in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas got before the church and recounted the signs, wonders, and miracles God had done through them among the Gentiles. And they would say, wow, am I glad I got in on that, you know? Am I glad I partnered with the Lord because everything that happens through those apostles, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy the, the benefit of. Um, the other word is kind of a heavy one. Having set forward or sent them towards worthily of God. This is the same word that Paul uses regarding the Lord's Supper when he talks about not partaking unworthily, okay? It's the word worthy or what would you say? Um, I'm looking for another word for worthy. Um, you are deserving? Who said that? Donna. Gold star for Donna. Yeah, deserving you're, you're doing it in an appropriate way, okay? 
that word has an alpha in front of it, unworthy. This is the same word without the alpha. With that, you know, it's like atheist, right? They also, and you put alpha in front of it, no God. If you leave the alpha off, then you're saying, you know, God. This is the same word. So <laughs> I can personally relate to this. I know Barb can, because um, we've done a lot of mission trips. And you can send somebody on a mission trip in an unworthy way. You know, we were living full time in Australia as missionaries and, and we needed our own car and people would give us one junk car after the other. We never knew what, what, where it was coming from, whose it was, how long we had it. But it, it, the idea was, I heard the preacher saying something Sunday morning about needing a car. Gosh, I wish I could help. But, you know, all I got's that junker in the backyard. Wait, What? Oh, it's for a missionary. Why didn't you tell me? I'll give that. I thought it was for somebody important. It's just for a missionary. I'll donate that. You know, I had one. Didn't have, the seat belts didn't work. You had to tie it, you know, and the speedometer didn't work. I'll never forget that. I was coming back from a meeting. Some were in the middle of nowhere up in the north of Australia, and I was just driving at night. You know, I didn't I just had to kind of guess how fast I'm going. And there was a seat belt tied, you know, naturally a cop pulled me over. He said, where are you going in such a hurry? I said, just trying to get home, mate, you know. And he said, uh, you know, you're going quite a bit over the speed limit. I said, really? I said, I, I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. I said, no. I said, I don't have a speed working speedometer. He said, this your car? I said, no, sir. He said, let me see your license. I showed him. Fortunately, it was signed Reverend, you know. <laughs> he said, you a preacher? I said, some people think so. And he said, uh, where are you going? I said, I just was at a meeting, and I'm going back to my house in Brisbane. He said, uh, what's that? I said, I, it's supposed to be a seatbelt. He said, it's just kind of laying over you. And I said, well, there's no hook for it. <laughs> so he reached in. He actually tied it for me. He said, this ought to work, mate. He said, watch your speed. He said, just try to keep up with the other cars. There were no other cars in the middle of the night. I said, thank you. You know what? I don't know if that was worthy of the Lord, the way we were sent forth. I'm sure they meant well, but you know what? I think maybe there was probably a better car someplace. Um, we, when, we, when we were there full time, uh, we were on a, a stipend uh, from the main organization, 50 bucks a week, I think it was. It was four adults and one child living on that because I wasn't allowed to work, neither was anybody else. I didn't have the right visa, had to only preach. And I was at a church one time, Huge church. Well, for back then it was a huge church, 1,000, 1,500 people. And um, the uh, pastor called me into his office before I preached. He said, how are you finding your meetings here? You know, I said, oh, pretty good. People seem to be getting blessed, this and that. He said, how are you doing financially? I said, not so good. And I told him, I said, you know, I'm on this stipend. But I said, you know, they don't take offerings or anything. He leaned back. He said, you know, I could take an offering for you tonight. I said, really? He said, if I took an offering for you tonight, I'll bet you'd get somewhere maybe in the neighborhood of $500. I said, really? Wow. He said, yeah, I'll bet you would. Guess what? He didn't take the offering. <laughs> oh, man, you can't make this stuff up. I went, I went to Haiti. I was the guest speaker. I was the speaker for the whole week of meetings. Thousands of people out in a soccer stadium. They forgot to get me a room. And my youth minister was with me. They, everybody else had a room in the hotel. They, they, we didn't have any. So you know where we wound up? The first night we were in a storage room. And right outside were chicken coops. And late at night you could hear people. You could hear the, uh, what do you call, devil people down the road sacrificing chickens. You know, and I'm looking at the ceiling in the storage room. Looked over at my youth pastor. I said, what do you reckon? He just shook his head. <laughs> I said, Lord, going to stick with us or we're stuck, you know. I mean, it all worked out. But my point is, uh, it's even in the word of God, we should, we should send people forth in a way worthy of God. In other words, you send them forth just like you would do Jesus. And I'm not saying we have to like some of these knuckleheads are doing today where they have to have certain flowers and the certain gym and this and that. I don't mean that silliness. But I mean, Whatever the church could afford, you know, something halfway decent. You know, when we have speakers here that are from out of town, we, we try to do right by them. 
But this is what's going on here. Now, why should we do this? How should we treat visiting ministry? I'm, I'm mentioning as though we're sending Jesus out, much as we can. And then why? L look at this. For on behalf of the name, they went forth, continually taking not even one thing from the nations. Here's this other word now. Eth uh, if from ethnos, ethnos, ethnikon. These are non-Jewish people. So now we know that the people they're going to are not only non-believers, but they are Gentile non-believers because he uses that word for the nations. Now, what does it mean when these missionaries went out on behalf of the name? What does that mean? We don't really know. It could be the ineffable name, the holy name, the covenant name of God, the Hebrew uh, name for God, Yahweh. It could be that. Or it could be Jesus, right? It could be Jesus. Now, I've mentioned this before, and I think it's a pretty good tip for when you and I study the Bible, whether together or in a group. Um, when you're trying to figure out what something means that looks a little bit um, difficult, it's always good to look at, at the, the speaker or the writer who's writing, compare what he's writing with what he's written elsewhere, the context, et cetera, et cetera. Well, interestingly enough, we find John, the apostle, the same one that wrote this, in his first letter, we see him writing in 1 John 4, 18, herein is our love made perfect in order that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, right? Because, because as, instead of saying he, meaning Jesus, because as he is, of toast, because as he is, John says, because as echinos. And that is a beautiful word. Why is that, preacher? Because, I'm sorry, echinos, actually. It means that one, it's a demonstrative pronoun. So the picture is, John is so enamored of Jesus he is so reverent toward the Son of God, toward the Savior, that on occasion he, he doesn't even use his given name, Jesus. He uses this demonstrative pronoun to kind of point him out in a special way. How many understand what I'm talking about? So I personally think he's talking about the name of Jesus. And when you look at other scriptures, uh, Peter's saying there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, and when he does the miracle, it was in the name of Jesus, the faith that is through him. So I think for John, he's probably talking when he says they went out on behalf of the name. He probably means the name Jesus. And they took not even one thing from their listeners. Uh, and I think that's wise, don't you? Can you see the possible problem if they took money from non-believers? They could possibly be accused of being in this preaching thing for the money, you know. So to avoid that, any possibility of scandal, it's good that the missionary party is already taken care of. Not that uh, believers, people that become believers couldn't support the work. They could, but they wouldn't have to. And, and uh, so in other words, the burden is on the people of God to take care of, of these apostles. Now, the bottom line so we come in for a landing here. Um, just like always, we have here the valley of decision. We have the hinge. This is where the mystery of free will comes in. This doesn't happen automatically. That evangelist and his wife, sitting in two different parts of the auditorium, did not have to obey what they thought was the leading of the Lord and give all the money they had left in their purse and wallet. They didn't have to do that. They chose to. The choice is ours. Listen to what John says. He adds a pronoun here for emphasis. He means we, we therefore, ought to receive, and the phrase is, such ones. It's an interesting little turn of phrase. Tus, tiutos which means the ones, these. Who are these? Apparently, they're good apostles, true missionaries. The idea is not everyone is. How many have learned that? 
I bet we could stay here for hours and trade stories about false prophets that scammed a local church or gave prophecies in length based on what the offering was. Our dear friend Greg has mentioned to me on more than one occasion a particular church that he had visited or was somehow connected with, worship there or whatever. Um, on one occasion, some visiting prophets, they actually had pew set aside. You could sit there depending on how much you gave. Yeah. But apparently these particular apostles, missionaries, were the, the real deal. And so John says to Yeos, the local pastor and his people by extension, all of us ought to receive these people. How many remember in 1 Timothy when Paul's talking about the characteristics of, uh, of a bishop, of a pastor, of an elder? Among other things, he says hospitable. How many have read that? Now, does that mean that Barb and I should be having potluck suppers every weekend for our church people at our house? Because I'm, I'm a bishop, I should be hospital, Right? On the surface, that's what it looks like. How many of you know not, not all pastors, not all pastors' wives are that kind of person? They don't all have the gift of gab. Well, I'm so glad that's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about this. When visiting ministry comes, you should welcome the visiting ministry. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember Mission Sundays. Anybody ever remember those? Yeah, Joe does. Yeah, so they have a Sunday night service and you have the missionaries that were sent out from that local church. I remember it back in Pittsburgh. Had it all the time. Somebody come in from Peru, and they'd have their little gimmicks and little gadgets that they got, and, and pictures, you know, and, and uh, back then, whatever they had of, you know, who they got saved, and maybe a pictures of a water baptism or whatever. I miss those things, but this is what he's on about here. Receiving people like this, welcoming them into the fellowship, giving them the pulpit. We've had numerous missionaries in this church over the years. Remember Brother Liberius from Haiti? His English was a little difficult to track sometime, but his heart was right. And, uh, you know, he had had me down there to cr preach crusades, and it was neat to hear what was going on. That's what he's talking about there. For the true, the good apostles, the good missionaries, whatever word you want to use, uh, we should get involved. We should help them out. We ought to receive them and then, you know, be the, be the launch pad so that they can be that boomerang. Now, I love this. We, we, therefore, ought to receive such ones in order that we may be fellow workers with the truth. This is so cool to me. I, you know, I don't like to think that I'm straining a gnat, you know, and, and just press on the word. To every little bit of juice comes out. Yeah, I am. But, but this, is, to me, is really neat. Do you know that word, we, we are fellow workers with the truth? Do you know what and it's actually become? That we might become. You know, Matha, that we might become. It's the word we get the, the word Genesis, Yenesis from. Yenos, you know, it, it's like birth. And it's, it's in the middle voice, which means you and I, have the opportunity to be co-workers with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, with the truth. And John tells us the Spirit is the truth. We can choose to partner with the Holy Spirit. We can become co-workers. It doesn't happen automatically, but we can choose to. How cool is that? It's like, here's the opportunity. Here's the opportunity. Uh, so-and-so's going to Thailand, or so-and-so's going to uh, Africa, or someone so-and-so's going to Greenland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, you know, we, we don't have many people there. How many would like to become, become, sin er a, a worker with, sin er working, sin with, a co-worker with these honest missionaries? What's the Bible basis? What's that? Boy, you hear that? That's the landing gear coming down. We're almost there. We're almost there. If you've got a pen, pencil, or dirty fingernail, write these down. Here's the biblical background of being a co-worker with God. You and I aren't necessarily the person going out. We're not the apostle, necessarily. But we're part of a local church that has the right kind of leadership who's hospitable to traveling ministry and believes in sending them 
toward the people they're called to minister to in a manner worthy of God, not seeing if they can dog it or not. And how did it start? Here's the first thing that I want to share with you tonight. 1 Samuel 30, 23 through 35. Just make a note of that. 1 Samuel 30, 23 through, th through 25. David initiated this. Very simply, they had, God's people under David had conquered the Philistines. And unfortunately, not all the soldiers available were ready, willing, and able to fight. They were exhausted, so some stayed back with the stuff. Others went and did the fighting. And when it was all over, the ones that had done the fighting, some of them said, hey, let's forget about these deadbeats that didn't go out into the battle. We've got the plunder, but we don't have to give them anything. What did David say? No, no, no. The one that stayed gets the same blessing as the one that goes out. And the Bible says it was made a statute forever for Israel, for the people of God. And you and I are adopted Israelites, aren't we? Sons of Abraham by faith. 1 Samuel 30, 23 through 25, there's the principle that the ones who actually do it and the ones who stay behind but are part of that group have the same reward. Jesus, again, reiterated it in the New Testament, Matthew 10, 41 and 42. He said, if you, if you join with an apostle or a prophet, you get that man or woman of God's reward. You share in the reward. Even, he said, if you receive them, if you receive them, you receive me. So, Yeos and that local congre congregation who said yes to missions night was doing what Jesus said. And that pastor and those people will share in the reward. We've already mentioned Luke 16, 19, another saying of Jesus. Make friends, make friends with the unrighteous money so that when it fails or when you die, the people you've brought into the kingdom through your gifts will welcome you. Luke chapter 16, verse 19, and we preached on this some time ago. Acts 20, verse 35, Paul quotes Jesus as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we mentioned why that is. Receiving is, is confined to this world, isn't it? How many like to receive? The rest of you are liars, repent. We all like to receive, but when do we do that? Here. Here. And that's, that's where it ends. But giving is not confined to this world. It continues to bring forth rewards. It gets, a, it gets written in heaven. And it's, you know, it's, still, it's still gaining momentum. It's, it's quite amazing, isn't it? And then Paul confirmed it in Philippians 4, 18 and 19. He basically tells the church in Philippi, hey, you know what? I appreciate you remembering me and sending gifts. He wasn't pastoring there. He was in apostolic ministry, but they partnered with him, apparently in supporting him with material and financial gifts. And then he went on to say, and my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. In other words, you sowing liberally, you'll reap liberally here and hereafter. And they were cooperating with the Holy Spirit by ministering to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And this is what, this is what John is telling Yeos to do. We should do this so that we can become, it's in our own best interest to do it, fellow, fellow workers with the Holy Spirit, with the truth. So this is kind of cool, in my opinion. Like you mentioned in the bulletin, why bother supporting the work of God? This is some pretty good reasons, don't you think? David established that as a kind of principle in the Old Covenant. Jesus ratified it in the Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and other places. Paul quotes Jesus as affirming it in Acts 20, verse 35. And then Paul, speaking of his own work as a minister, as a missionary, uh, promises a blessing to another local church for getting involved. So the choice is ours, whether or not we want to be co-workers with God. And we've got not a lot, but a handful of people that are not members here. They don't live in this area, but they are partnering with us, not as a local church, but as an apostolic ministry. And they're going to share in the reward. Everything we get involved in, everything that we're, we're accomplishing, they're going to share in the reward. I was talking to Jeff just the other day. I forgot about this. When we were 
uh, having our, our radio network. Some of you remember it lasted just about 10 years before that hosting site stopped doing what they were doing. And we had like listeners from 120 some countries. We were on 24 hours, 365. I had forgotten on the weekends, Jeff's local station that he works at was using our radio network for their weekend broadcasting. So not only were we getting one weekly release on Friday, but we were getting three, four, five extra ones on the overnight hours. And that was for over three years. Not just locally, but they have their own online stream, 120-some countries. That's favor. I really believe that that station manager will share in the reward for choosing to use our radio network rather than some other kind of programming on their weekends. Jeff just found out recently the new owner of the station a lot of times will change the automation that Jeff has set up, what kind of songs and so on, and he'll just stop it and he'll play programs like ours. Jeff didn't even know he was doing it. So we're paying for one release per week and he's playing more of our stuff, just wants to. He said, I, he said, I play the good ones sometimes in, in place of some music. And I thought that was so cool. I firmly believe he and the station and people there are going to share in who we're touching worldwide. Amen. So this is kind of, to me, very, very interesting how this all works together for good. And um, we won't know the whole story till we get on the other side. Amen. Any questions tonight or input, output? Does this seem kind of encouraging? Can you put a lid on this? Not really. You really don't know where it's going to end, do you? Questions? Anyone anywhere? No? Cool. How many are glad you're involved? The only regrets I have are when I didn't give more to different ministries, different ministers, because some of them are upstairs now. And I think, oh, man, I wish there was some way I could go back, you know. But there's a blessing there. Amen. We're going to come around the Lord's table. If you have gifts tonight, that's great. There are baskets here and also one in the hallway. Uh, and God will bless you. Solomon's going to. Yes, sure, absolutely. Uh, on a top secret project for Westinghouse Electric. <laughs> It's not secret anymore no. about uranium um, prices. Uh, apparently, all the uranium companies in the world had formed a cartel and they were driving the prices up and putting Westinghouse out of business. We were just basically paper shoppers. We were looking through papers for, anyway, toward the end of that, when, when that was drawing to a close, somebody came through and said, We're looking for people with a science degree to, because. What we were doing there was looking through pages and pages of stuff that came off the Xerox machines and circling references to uranium prices. Yeah. And uh, they said, we're, we're looking for people with scientific degrees who would like to go out to Washington State and um, work on new methods of handling data, handling information. If you do the math, this could have been the beginning of Microsoft. I don't know, but it was something like that. And um, I had a like a minor in biology and chemistry, so they offered me the chance to go. And, and back then, they said the, the salary would be between twelve and sixteen thousand a year, and that was phenomenal for for me back then. And when I prayed about it, the Lord said, "No, I want you to stay here, marry Joe, and be." This part of my ministry. And I thought, wow. Yeah, well, fortunately, I was a new Christian, so I still had that crazed attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do anything. <laughs> so I said yes to the Lord. Poor and, kid. Um, boy. Poor kid. <laughs> I'll tell you, it has been such an adventure. I don't have any regrets, but I would like to know what happened to those people. Yeah. They eventually became. When you think about that, you know, the West Coast, it's amazing. 1976, new wow. methods of handling information. Sure. We didn't do anything with computers then. No. That was back when dinosaurs were on the earth. Yeah. Wow.
<clears throat> That's quite a testimony. So anyway, if God tells you to do something like that or asks you to say yes, that's <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Yeah. I didn't think that that place would have sent me all over the world like the Lord has. <clears throat> I would have never seen the miracles and never gotten. That's good. That's right. We wouldn't have Solomon. <laughs> Solomon. Details. <laughs> You're welcome to just serve yourself.